Well, thank you very much to all our speakers. I welcome any questions from our audience members in the Q&A box below. We will try and get through them all here in the last couple minutes we have of this hour. Again, if we don't get through all the questions, we'll provide those questions to our speakers so that we can have some uh, written answers for you in the in the archive. While I wait for some questions to come up in the Q&A box, um, I'll pose a, maybe a more uh, theoretical question to our to our panelists. When we talk about integrated crop and livestock systems, and when we talk about the different scales of, um, let's say, this circularity, it's going to require a lot of collaboration, right? What are what are some ways that those of us that you know advise? Um, the ag sector, whether it's livestock or crop or both, you know, what are some ways that we can help forge some of that collaboration for these discussions or, or for advancing this circularity concept? I think that's a great question. I think one of the areas that I get a lot of questions at already is how do we take some of these industrial byproducts and use them to support crop production, right? And that could be municipal sludges. Hopefully we're exporting a third of our nutrients with the pig to uh, slaughter facilities, some fraction of that we eat and excrete. And, and if you really want to complete the circle, we have to start thinking about getting those back on cropland, right? And, and maybe they're not as pleasant of fertilizers as we're used to in terms of manure. Uh, certainly some of them have very strange characteristics. I know one that I had the opportunity or pleasure of working with tested 40 pounds of sulfur per thousand gallons the other day. And I had never seen anything nearly that high. I thought swine manure was high and it, it's like eight pounds of, right? So we're talking five times higher. Uh, but I think if, if we're going to try and be circular, we have to try and integrate some of those back as a, as a fertilizer. And it offers different challenges, different opportunities. And, and there are certainly concerns when working them that we're not used to. Any other thoughts on enhancing collaboration from those of us that advise? I, I, I can just uh, share one more thing, uh, Aaron, that uh, the interdisciplinary collaborations are, are key uh, if you want to generate more data. Mm -hmm. And um, all the uh, projects that are focused on circularity, I can see that uh, the collaborations are between agronomy and uh, animal sciences, uh, ag engineering, uh, and we see more and more artificial intelligence because we see so many different aspects uh, of those disciplines being used uh, to make sure that we look at the systems, uh, look, look at the production systems in a total systems perspective, right? We just don't look at uh, one particular area. And I think there's a lot more work needs to be, did, uh, needs to be done in this area. But I, I can see that these multidisciplinary collaborations are already happening uh, in this. Wonderful. We have some questions from our audience. Um, first one, Dan, I'll start with you. What are, do you get a sense, you've presented several different metrics, right, of circularity. Do you get that there is um, a preference to, to one or more of them? I mean, I have preferences, but I think when you look at a lot of what's out there, there's still a lot of opportunity. Part of that's we don't know the right metric, right? It's mm -hmm. it's a world of exploration, and we have to handle some of the critical questions. I mentioned how do you handle legumes as an input, right? It <laughs> it certainly is an input, but there isn't even agreement necessarily on what's the right approach for considering that as an input. Is it something natural so we don't have to charge it against ourselves, or is it something uh, where we should be thinking about it like an input? Um, I know a lot of the standard engineering sort of efficiency metrics, right? We used to have uh, feed conversion efficiency in the livestock sector, for instance, you've seen a drive to move that towards maybe calorific efficiency or protein conversion efficiency, but that doesn't take you all the way around the loop or the circle, right? So um, I still like thinking about a system efficiency, counting manure as a resource and thinking about it as a fertilizer, but there is a large number of metrics that are still being proposed. I think that probably all have different uses and all of them are important, but we haven't said it's not quite to the level of life cycle assessment where we break it down and say we need a metric for greenhouse gas or eutrophication. Uh, but there's a lot of opportunities, and I think there's a couple that apply. Living in Iowa, I like uh, the percent of self-reliance for feed. If I was sitting in North Carolina, I would probably say that metric doesn't make as much sense to me, right? It's just not one mm -hmm. that fits. So I think you might see more regional demand for these metrics than maybe we, we'd hope or we're used to, but they all serve a purpose and, and work better in other places or other okay. use cases. Thanks, Dan. 
I'm going to direct this next question to Mahmoud. The question is on the circularity and value-added products and, and somewhat this big picture circularity question. If manure is used to produce fuels and chemicals, you know, is the end goal to recycle those fuels and chemicals on farm? You know, is that part of the circularity question or, or not? Really, that's a really good question. And I think it really ties to the boundary uh, aspect to that Dr. Vias and myself mentioned. And uh, whether it is used locally, and there are arguments depending on the practitioners where they would like the circle to be as small as possible, so be self-reliant as a unit, or simply as an economy to be self-reliant, it really depends on where you are. Again, I'm going to use the example uh, what uh, Dan mentioned. Here in North Carolina, you cannot really be self-reliant to produce feed, for instance, unless you are going into a route like a producing larva, for instance, or uh, uh, algal proteins or other non-terrestrial crop protein. So there is really opportunities um, to reintroduce the value-added products into the economy at different scales. And that's one of the ways that the, the economic opportunity presents itself. We oftentimes find that the we are only aware of the proximity opportunities or proximal opportunities for reintroducing the product simply because of who we know. Mm -hmm. And um, as we have these conversations, more and more people are able to understand a, the concept and reintroducing products produced from, uh, for instance, fly larva to feed animals are not really a challenge, whether here in North Carolina or further from the facility itself um, and so on. Thank you. Um, Dr. Bias, do you have some, uh, or can you provide some examples of, you know, where the examples of insect, insects as feed, where that's being used, or, you know, where you see that potentially being used in the nearest future? In some of the research data that has been generated, and I can, I, I can speak from the ruminants perspective, is that uh, there is a potential uh, of using these larvae for sheep and goat, like small ruminants. Um, and some beef cattle. Um, for dairy cattle, I have not seen that being used so much, uh, but for the other three species I have. And uh, I think uh, it all depends on how economically feasible this is, uh, because uh, some of the producers can grow in, in, in their backyard uh, using kitchen waste. Uh, they can grow their larvae and then uh, they can have a a uh, good source of this protein if, if they do not have a lot of animals, like maybe, you know, five or six goats or, or sheep, less than 10. Um, but there are some companies that are coming up, like EnviroFlight I shared in my presentation. Uh, these companies are actually targeting uh, making this available to a larger sector of producers so that they can feed that on a large scale as well. Um, so the data that I have seen is mostly on the small ruminants, um, but... Uh, I think it all depends on how economically feasible it is. It can be escalated to, to other species as well. Well, you bring up this concept of environmental feasibility, and that leads into our uh, last question as of right now in our Q&A chat. And, and the question is, where do economics fit into the research and collaboration on implementation of, of circularity? You know, of course, if we can make things more economically sustainable, that opens the doors for implementation. But how do we advance that? On, on the research side, on the collaboration side? It's a big question. It really is. I think um, uh, it really requires the entire pipeline of research from the bench top to the uh, pilot scale applications to a lot of the model developing teams um, that puts these pieces together and are able to quantify the what would the cost be? All of the ways to de-risk the process of adopting this. Um, all the way to one aspect that also gets missed, which is the regulatory comfort mm -hmm. with this new way of making a product. So, and, and colleagues that work on feed animal uh, or feeding animals recognize that not every product that could be fed in a trial can be actually enter the market and be traded. Um, but going back to the economics, uh, modeling, our, our techno-economic modeling or feasibility are one of the powerful tools that we use. Um, and they could be used by researchers uh, as well as by commercial entities to do that sort of work. Um, and they're powerful in the sense because they can look internally into the technology in all of the different ways it could be optimized to reduce the cost of producing the commodity, but also to look into the value or the what is the minimum sale price for this commodity and how it can compete with the 
replacement product or the competition in the market. So a lot of the times there are conversations around, do you create a novel product with the novel attributes or you try to mimic an existing product identical to it? There are pros and cons to each. Uh, to replace an existing product in the market, you are competing with the, the established supply chain and the economic um, um, opportunities that it took uh, to be established. Um, and we see that when we start to, to do our type of modeling, we see also the logistics become a critical aspect of it. Um, so uh, certainly I've, I can advocate for the way that modeling can take these, our understanding of the system and modeling it to arrive at a reliable estimate of the economics of this. And then that becomes the what we move to our policymakers, our regulators of if we are already at economic adoption, we see that with some technologies, no intervention is really needed and it's just the economy takes care of it. Otherwise, what are the incentives and how to structure it to move it forward? Well, I wanna thank all three of our speakers for taking this somewhat nebulous topic, right? And starting to put some structure on it. Of course, there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of challenges and, and still a lot of unknowns in this topic of circularity, but we are making some strides and, and the integrated crop and livestock systems that the majority of us work with on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Are, are a key part to these to circular systems or a key example, let's say, of potentially circular systems.